A very warm welcome to the second in this new series of Anna Freud Center's Transformation Seminars. We are really delighted that so many of you are able to join us tonight. This seminar couldn't happen at a more relevant time. The government has just announced plans to overhaul the Mental Health Act. But in the midst of a global pandemic, which is not only causing terrible physical suffering, but is also impacting on our mental health. We need to focus on, think and talk about mental health. The theme of the transformation seminars is thinking differently about mental health. We want to provide a space where those interested public and professionals can join our speakers to reflect on how we might tackle the growing problem which is child and family mental health. But it's not something anyone can do on their own. Our transformation seminars are carried out in the spirit of inquiry and collaboration. We hope that after today's seminar, you will be inspired to continue to discuss some of the issues raised here today with friends and with colleagues. We also hope that you'll be able to join us throughout this series of seminars. All the information is, of course, on our website. The seminars invite speakers to respond to a simple question. What is their idea to transform children's and families' mental health in the UK? We know that demand for mental health support is increasing and that this need cannot and perhaps should not be met by professionals alone. The seminars explore areas beyond clinical interventions, important though these are, to ask how we can think about and do things differently, individually, collectively, and as a society to reduce the growing needs we have as individuals in our complex and interconnected social world and tackle some of the underlying causes. As we speak, we would like to invite you to ask some questions. You will see at the bottom of your screen that there's a space for Q and A's. If you'd like to submit your questions, we'll try to get through as many of them as possible in the time that we have. Finally, if you're tweeting, please tag us and use the hashtag transformation seminars. I started off by talking about the pandemic and it's interesting how this brought about something of a public awakening about the importance of social relationships in relation to our mental health and well-being. It's a theme that our speaker, Professor Louise Arsenault, has been exploring with great brilliance over years. She has argued, and I hope will argue today, that social relationships can be considered as targets for interventions in the ameliorating risk factors associated with poor mental health and to build the resources necessary to help face life's challenges. We are incredibly privileged to have Louise deliver today's seminar. Louise is Professor of Developmental Psychology in the Social, Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Center in the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's, King's College London. She has taught there since 2001. After completing her PhD in Biomedical Sciences at the University of Montreal, Louise, luckily for all of us, moved to the UK for a postdoctoral training at the MRC Social, Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Center. In 2018, Louise was elected a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. 
She's also Mental Health uh, Leadership Fellow at the Economic and uh, Social Research Council. And in addition to work on social relationships, is known for the absolutely groundbreaking research on mental disorders, substance abuse, and the mental health effects of childhood bullying. Louise is somebody whose work we have read for many years and followed with enormous and deep respect. Her work harnesses and combines three different research approaches. Developmental research, epidemiological methods, and genetically sensitive designs. Her work incorporates social as well as biological measurements across the lifespan. Her multidisciplinary approach has enabled her to think as broadly as she does, also uncommonly deeply. And today we are beneficiaries of her approach. Louise has been recognized for her outstanding contributions to biomedical and health science, leading research discoveries and translating developments into benefits for patients and the wider society. It's this last part of her work that we are particularly grateful to hear about today. The application of rigorous learning to benefit us all. There can be nothing more relevant in these troubled times than to consider how social relationships can help transform children and families' mental health. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce Louise Arsenal to you this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this uh, extremely kind um, presentation introduction. I'm, I'm very pleased to be uh, joining you this evening for this um, seminar series. Um, Good evening to all of you. It's a shame I cannot see you, um, um, but uh, hopefully the interaction that we're going to have online will be beneficial um, and interacting as well. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my, um, my screen and my slides, and hopefully everything will be just um, fine, and Peter will confirm that in a few seconds. Peter, can you? Um, ah, wait. There you go. I can, I can see your screen. If you put it on um, uh, presentation mode, that'd be fine. There you go. Is that Perfect. correct? Great. Perfect. Great. OK, um, so I will not. Um, um, spend any more time talking about who I am. I think that Peter did a, a wonderful job. Um, and I will go straight into the idea that I want to propose to you and um, for transforming um, children and families mental health in the UK. And that is investing in positive relationships and that for a very young age. So more than ever today, we realize that social relationships and interpersonal connections are really fundamental to human life. So positive social relationships provide support in times of stress, while the absence or the removal of these connections or bad relationships can cause distress and present potential long-term implication for mental health and functional um, outcome. Um, so today, um, I would want to um, uh, present to you a series of um, five findings to really convince you that um, positive relationships are good for mental health and well-being, and negative relationships can actually be harmful um, for uh, mental health and well-being. And I want, throughout my presentation, I want to highlight a few points. And I will um, um, really put an emphasis on those, um, those points. Um, 
And I want to make sure as well that Rob and Rose, if I speak too fast, please let me know, um, because I tend to get carried away and I will get excited at some point um, and I will start talking fast. Okay, so let me, <laughs> let me um, introduce you those points that I want to really highlight throughout my presentation. And um, I will present to you um, findings about um, negative relationships and also about positive relationship and how they can buffer the effect of stress on mental health um, uh, people, of people. I will want throughout my presentation to take a life course approach, um, trying to demonstrate that um, social relationships are not uh, essential for only one bracket of age or one age period, but they are important throughout the lifespan. Unfortunately, during my presentation, I will have to focus or I will have to kind of exclude really, really early um, uh, years in life and the later life as well. And I will focus uh, periods ranging from childhood up to midlife. I want to um, introduce the idea of the importance of having good, reliable data to conduct the research that we do. So throughout my presentation, I will try to really emphasize the importance, the importance of good data. I will also emphasize the importance of having good research methods for being able to answer really innovative and provoking research questions. And finally, I really want to make sure that um, the findings that I will present to you can be translated into proper intervention, innovative intervention, an intervention that can really make a difference for children and families' uh, mental health uh, and well being. Right. So I told you that I would talk about different types of social relationships. And the first type of, um, of a marker of poor social relationship that I want to put forward to you is bullying victimization. And if some people kind of heard me talk about uh, talk heard me talk before, you will not be surprised that I'm talking about bullying victimization. I researched that topic for several years. And I really aim to show that um, or to answer the question as to whether but being victim of bullying in childhood can really have an impact on mental health. So first, um, let me tell you about uh, bullying victimization, which for this presentation, I will focus on childhood bullying victimization. And bullying victimization um, is a repeated occurrence of abuse between people of about the same age where an imbalance of power makes it difficult for the victims to defend themselves. So bullying can take place between children, between adolescents, and as some of us know, also between adults. But there are three factors which are important that distinguish bullying, and that is it's a, um, a peer victimization. So it takes place between people of about the same age. It's also a pattern of interaction so that fighting on the playground because, you know, there's an argument is not necessarily bullying. And you really have to have this power imbalance whereby it's more difficult for the victim to defend uh, themselves. And that is really bullying. Now, there's been lots of research in the past um, looking at the association between being bullied and having mental health problems. Um, and quite often, this link has been taken to assume that being bullied is a cause of mental health problems. That was quite a bit of a, um, a quick conclusion from findings that were not necessarily meant to indicate that. So let me put forward some alternative hypothesis. So it is possible that actually having mental health problem at a young age can increase the risk of children to being bullied. So thereby, the link between being bullied and having mental health problems later doesn't exist 
because this link is basically accounted for by prior mental health problems. So we really need to test to be able to um, remove this alternative hypothesis to make sure it's, it's not the case that the link that we observe is just accounted for by prior mental health problems. And for a long time, lots of research didn't look for that. And also what, another point which is important to, con to consider is that the link between being bullied and having mental health problems can be accounted for by other factors and especially other factors that are shared by people from the one family. And we can consider kind of some of those factors. So you can have, for example, um, living in an area where you don't have that many um, resources or community services, going into a school where, um, oh, this is the one that I should kind of point for, I think. Um, um, so kind of going to a school where um, bullying is allowed or tolerated. Um, another factor would be having parents um, who have psychopathology. Think about, you know, a mom who has depression or a father or who's criminal. Other factors that people from one family share are, of course, their genes. And more so, you know, we know now that a genetic influence, you know, is everywhere and it contributes to mental health and well-being. So it is really important to take this influence uh, when we look for other factors, and especially when we look at uh, social interactions, such as uh, being bullied uh, in childhood. So it's really important to consider all those factors to make sure that the link that we observe between being bullied and mental health problem is really a strong, robust link. So I really put that to a test by using data from a study which is called the Environmental Risk Longitudinal Study, otherwise known as E-Risk. And E-Risk is a cohort of twins who were born between 1994 and 1995 in England or in Wales. And we visited those twins and their family when they were age five, again at age seven, age 10, age 12, and the last time we saw them, they were young adults, so they, um, they were at age 18. And through the years, we asked questions a lot to the moms, but also to the twins themselves, especially when they were older. And, you know, we kind of had games with them when they were um, younger. We also asked questions to their teachers to really have um, a source of data coming from lots of different people. You can see that the retention rate of the e-risk study is quite impressive. So um, when they were um, still young, 96% of the twins and their families took part in the study, and 93% of them still took part of the study when they were age um, 18. So to answer the question that I asked, we use data from um, mums who reported about their kids being victims of bullying when they were age um, seven. So this is bullying victimization that took place between, b during the first two years of formal schooling, basically. We also use data uh, of emotional problems, so symptoms of anxiety and depression in childhood, um, reported by both the moms and the teachers when uh, the twins were age five and also when they were age uh, 10. And I told you that the E-Risk study is a study of twins and um, we have a very nice study design to be able to disentangle the effect of being bullied on the twins' mental health and well-being, um, controlling for the effect of the family environment. And we use a twin design that we call the discordant monozygotic twin design. Um, and it is some kind of a natural experiment where you have two individuals who are genetically identical, who grew up in the same family, but one twin has been bullied and the other one not. So that is a very powerful study design because it controls for a lot of factor um, all at once. 
And what we did was to use regression models using the whole of the E-risk study, so monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins, and those regressions allowed us to kind of pull apart the effect of the family um, on this relationship between being bullied and having emotional problems, and also kind of uh, pull apart this kind of unique effect, and that's what we are interested in, this kind of really unique effect here. And I'm going to show you the findings. Um, I just want to mention that the analyses that we've conducted were done on the whole sample. So it's a sample of 2,232 children. But I will illustrate the finding very simply with a graph here where you have monozygotic twin. One twin has been bullied on the left-hand side. And then you have their co-twins who haven't been bullied on the right hand side. On the y axis here, you have emotional problems, so symptoms of anxiety and depression, when the twins were age 10. And we kind of standardized those um, scores, so the mean for the whole sample is zero, basically. And what this graph shows, illustrates, is that those twins who were bullied between the ages of five and seven had more emotional problems at age 10 compared to their co-twin who were not bullied. And these differences remain even after controlling for emotional problems at age five, so prior to being bullied. So this finding is quite strong in showing that being bullied in childhood contributes to emotional symptoms or emotional problems controlling for genetic factors, controlling for environmental family factors, and also for controlling for emotional problems prior to the experience of being bullied. So you may think that maybe those findings are kind of a bit strange and maybe due to you know, the, the, our cohort, the E-Risk study, but I would want to reassure you and um, just say to you that recently, Two other studies using different cohorts of twins have replicated um, our um, these differences. So that is reassuring in that other studies can find something um, similar. So implications, oh yes. So um, I want to emphasize here um, the method and the method is just the beauty of the cool twin design, uh, which allows us to really pull apart environmental factor and genetic factors. Some of you have may uh, come across a paper earlier this, no, last week, um, which said, you, which kind of suggested or demonstrated that uh, monozygotic twins are actually not so identical genetically. So that's really interesting. And I really need to kind of go back and, and read that paper. Um, and it shows you as well that um, methods always kind of um, um, change and improve through years. So that is a good thing in, in some ways. Um, but so far, I still feel confident that our findings are, are strong. And the implications for intervention from this first set of findings is, is that showing that being bullied contribute to mental health problems, um, we should actually support intervention that aims to reduce bullying behaviors, because if we manage to reduce bullying behaviors, we should be able to reduce mental health problems um, in young children. So interventions, you know, taking place in schools to really control those kind of behaviors should be encouraged. And we know that there are quite good programs, you know, kind of doing that right now. The questions that we had following this set of findings and after many years kind of researching the topic and, and considering it, a further question that we had was that, well, hang on, what if even after stopping those bullying behaviors, the young victims continue to have mental health uh, problems? And that brings me to my second set of findings. I wanted to test whether the impact of being bullied on children's mental health could be long-lasting. 
as you can imagine, I cannot test that question using Iris because I just showed you that last time we saw them, they were 18. So to me, it was not kind of long enough. I wanted to know further in life. What about in adulthood? So I had to turn to a different study and we very lucky for us, we had access to the National Child Development Study, otherwise known as the 1958 British cohort. So in the UK, we're really lucky to have all those beautiful cohort and we can access those data. So the 1958 British cohort is basically um, a study that um, examine um, and engage with participants who were born in one week um, in 1958. So as you can imagine, you know, it's a large, large study. Uh, at inception, you had more than 18,000 people who took part of the, uh, in the study. Um, as you can see, there's a great participation rate in childhood, which tend to decrease, but you know, it's always like this for um, longitudinal study. And amazingly, um, Today, I'm going to present to you data up to age 50. But if you calculate, um, you will know that we NCDS has collected data more recently when the participants were age um, 60. But I, I, I didn't go that far. The data is not yet available, I think. For um, that study, I um, we use data for, uh, about bullying victimization, once again, provided by the moms. And this time we use data when the participants were age seven and again at age 11. And maybe I should mention here that NCDS is not a study of twins. These are singletons. So um, just to make it sure, we forget about the twins anymore. This is singletons. The beauty of NCDS is that it's spanning across six decades, which is very unusual for um, that kind of study. So bullying victimization was assessed mother report, age seven and age 11 for the kids. And then I wanted to look at psychiatric outcomes and I will use data collected by the study at age 45. And I will look at social relationships as well at age um, 50. Um, so is the effect long lasting? So here I need to acknowledge the contribution of my um, colleague, Liyu Takizawa, who's now working at the University of Tokyo. But what Liyu and I showed was you did have a long lasting effect of being bullied in childhood on adult mental health problems. So you can see from this graph here on the Y axis percentages, so percentages of people um, who met diagnostic criteria for depression amongst those who were occasionally bullied in yellow and those who were frequently bullied in blue. So you can see that you have a overrepresentation of those who were bullied occasionally or frequently amongst those with depression. And those, uh, same thing for those with anxiety problems and those who had suicidal ideation or who attempted um, to take their own life. Of course, we had to control again for lots of childhood confounders to make sure that these other factors didn't account for the association. So we control for things like um, uh, parental SES, socioeconomic status, emotional and behavioral problems in childhood, other forms of adversity, such as being put in care, for example, low IQ. So, so we try really to test this relationship to the maximum, but it was robust. It still kind of stayed, even despite this huge kind of time lag between exposure and the outcome. And I also put this finding here about alcohol dependence because it was not significant. And it is in some ways reassuring that not everything is associated with uh, being bullied in, um, in childhood. And bear in mind once again, um, that this risk here is not big. It is not a, 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 um, a massive kind of risk 
associated with being bullied in childhood to have those mental health outcomes in, um, in adulthood, but it is robust. We also investigated um, other factors, other outcomes in adulthood, but I will not have time to kind of show them to you, but we've looked at physical health outcome, socioeconomic outcome. But for this presentation, I wanted to show you that being bullied in childhood was also associated with poor social relationships in adulthood. So in this graph, you still have percentages on the Y axis. And here you can see that um, people living without a partner or a spouse um, were overrepresented amongst those who were bullied. Uh, that people who are occasionally bullied or frequently bullied um, have are less likely to have met a friend in the past two weeks. And they were also less likely to perceive support when they feel unwell. So there seems to be an effect of being bullied in childhood, not just on mental health and well-being, but also on social relationship in adulthood. The beauty, I, you know, always the methods that I want to highlight um, here in this case is really the beauty of having those long lasting cohort studies. They are so rich with information and how lucky I was to access information on being bullied in childhood in the late 60s when bullying was not something so um, such of a concern by then. So the person who thought about including this item in that cohort study back then, I am very grateful because it allow us to really push the limit of testing the impact of being bullied in childhood. So um, this is really something uh, innovative. Um, yeah, to think about ad adding a question, you know, in that assessment. <clears throat> Um, implications for interventions. I think that these findings really highlight that focusing on reducing bullying behavior only is probably not enough. If we want to reduce mental health problems in childhood, we probably want to make sure that we provide support to the people who are the children who are victimized. Um, so we want to make sure that we can acknowledge that the experience they went through was um, something upsetting. Um, we want to monitor how they react, how they develop. And if there are signs of distress, we want to make sure that they don't develop in mental health problems. Um, so I think that the big message here is really kind of um, interventions, anti-bullying program wants to have a um, twofold aim stopping bullying behavior, but also providing support to the young victims. That brings me to my third set of findings. So there are lots of programs, anti-bullying programs, um, but I think that we need to kind of come up to the real or realize that they will not eradicate bullying entirely and that will leave some children vulnerable to um, bullying um, and their its outcomes, basically long-term and short-term on their mental health. So one idea that we could kind of propose is, is really to minimize the mental health impact um, on, the, the, on focusing on the victims and the potential victims. But how can we really kind of do that? One idea would be to focus on resilience. So can we really build resilience among those children who were victims of bullying, who didn't escape bullying victimization? Resilience is a dynamic process which encompasses positive adaptation in the context of adversity. It's difficult. We cannot measure or we cannot see resilience. This is something that we have to infer. And we have to infer that in the context of adversity. And in this case, adversity would be bullying victimization. And we want to make sure that 
those kids who were bullied do better than what we would expect given their experience. And because bullying takes place in schools quite often, not always, but quite often, so we've looked for factors in the family that could help those victims of bullying overcome their experience and you know, kind of manage their uh, symptoms, potential symptoms of mental health problems. So there you go. The, the second type um, of um, relationship that I would want to present is positive relationship within the context of um, the family. And I think that the concept of family is changing, isn't it? The, you know, the concept of family is not what it was kind of 50 years or 60 years. And, you know, this is in some ways provides lots of, of, of benefits. Um, but remember that family is pro provides the context for the first relationships to be developed for an individual. This is where we practice, you know, um, how to behave, you know, around people. And quite often, you know, uh, with the parents who provide uh, security and safety, but also with the siblings, you know, which provides to us the chance to kind of test boundaries and, and what is acceptable, what is not acceptable quite a lot. But that is really the first environment where those relationships um, develop. And we've looked in that environment um, for protective factors, factors that could explain why some kids do get bullied, but they're doing just fine. So maybe they have a good lessons to teach us as well. So we've looked at in the paper itself, we've looked at more factors, but I, for this presentation, I, I want to focus on relationships with um, the mom and relationships with the siblings. We have measures of what maternal warmth, um, which were derived by the EE. So the E is the expressed emotion. We asked the mothers when the twins were age five and 10 to speak about the, their children. And we recorded that and then coders back in the office um, coded, you know, the expressed emotion, the content, um, how it was warmed or hostile, basically. And we did that at age five and also at age 10. And we also kind of asked mother to tell us whether the, the, um, the twins or their sibling had good relationship, the extent to which they did activities together, they shared secrets, they liked spending time together. And we had that measure when the twins were seven and 10. Um, there you go. This is the findings. First, um, I will take you through it. Um, first of all, I would want to acknowledge the, uh, my colleague, Lucy Bowes, who's now a professor at the University of, of um, Oxford, who worked on that study with me a few years ago. Let me take you through um, the findings. So on the Y axis, you have emotional problems again, which are standardized again. So the mean sample is um, zero. And you have two sets of columns. You have the bullied twins on the left-hand side and the non-bullied twins on the right-hand side. And what this finding show you, first of all, is that those twins who have been bullied um, and this was um, by the age of seven, have more emotional problems uh, at age 12 in this case, compared to those twins who have not been bullied. But let's go back to those who've been bullied. You can see that those twins who've been bullied, who have um, high maternal warmth, sorry, there's a typo here. High maternal warmth have lower emotional problems compared to those who have not such maternal warmth here. Not surprisingly, we find exactly the same pattern for those who were not bullied. Those who were not bullied, but who have high maternal warmth, have lower levels of emotional problems compared to those who have not so much maternal warmth. So in some ways you may kind of say, well, why, you know, maternal warmth is important no matter what. It's, we know that it's good for any kids. 
The findings indicate that they, this is especially important for kids who've been bullied because the difference between the level of maternal warmth for those who've been bullied is greater than for those who haven't been bullied. So yes, having a mother who's warm, caring, attentive is important for all kids, but it is especially important for kids if they have been bullied. That is exactly what this um, bar, uh, that, that graph is showing. And it is following an interaction process. So we know that you have an effect of maternal warmth, but this effect is greater if the kids have been bullied. So it has a greater effect in reducing um, the probability of having emotional problems. Um, we found exactly the same pattern of findings when we looked at good relationship with the sibling, and now the labels are correct. So again, you have emotional problems at age 12 on the y-axis, bullied kids um, at the, um, on the left-hand side and non-bullied twins at the, in the right, at the right-hand side. And you can see again that you have a difference um, of emotional problems in those who were bullied, whether or not they had sibling warmth, good relationship for their siblings. And you have the same finding for the non-bullied twins, but the difference is greater in, amongst those who were bullied. So having good relationship with your siblings is good, but it is especially good for kids who've been bullied in reducing the likelihood that they will have mental health um, problems or emotional problems. And this finding comes from the e-risk study. I just want to make sure that we did control for um, uh, genetic confounds here as well. Um, and I'm not showing you the findings, but if you go to back to the paper, you will see that we showed that the effect is not due to moms passing on kind of uh, genes for resiliency to their kids. It really has to be a, an environmental effect from those relationships. So that is the beauty of um, the method, this interaction effect um, here that allows us to identify protective factors. Implications for interventions is that when we talk about bullying, families are important and good relationship in the families are important. I'm sure that, you know, if there are head teachers, you know, amongst you, if you are, there are teachers, you know, amongst you, I'm sure that you will have experience parents coming back to the school saying, my kid has been bullied, you have to do something. Yes, schools have a responsibility in providing safe and good environment to all the children. Families have a responsibility for supporting, helping young kids who've been bullied in making sure that the distress they're experiencing does not translate into mental health problems in the long run. So family really, Family uh, or uh, family relationship can be important in buffering the effect of being bullied in childhood on mental health problems. And I think it breaks down those kind of walls that we have around schools and family. We need to kind of work together. So that was in childhood. Let me move on to the next um, age period. So more kind of young adulthood and talk to you about loneliness. Loneliness, we all hear about loneliness right now, um, but you know, let me tell you about um, loneliness outside the, co the context of COVID. We always thought of loneliness as being something really important for um, elderly, elderly people. Um, but there is uh, recently kind of more and more uh, messages saying, no, actually young people do feel loneliness as well. And maybe we should kind of look into this. Um, Loneliness is a subjective experience. Loneliness is an experience that those relationships that you have are not as, satis as satisfying as what you wish, as what you want. It's different to social isolation, which is an objective measures, measure of having people around you or having good relationship. The two things are really different. And what we are focusing on for um, 
here in that study is really loneliness, this feeling that you're not happy with, you know, the quality or the quantity of social relationships that you have. This has been, yes, lots of research um, done in the um, older group. We wanted to know two questions. So is loneliness really kind of prevalent among young people? And we're gonna focus on young adulthood. So study members in the e-risk study when they were age 18. And is it associated with mental health uh, problems? So here I have to acknowledge the contribution of my colleague, Timothy Matthew, who's uh, at King's College, uh, who conducted this research. On the y-axis here, again, you have percentages. And here you have different items that were used to allow us to assess loneliness in our young adults. What you can see here is that you do have a fair proportion of our study members, e-risk, who reported feeling um, left out, isolated, alone, or that they're lacking companionship some of the time. But there is um, an important minority, so about 7%, who reported these symptoms often. And we should be worried about that, of course. So our study kind of reported other studies showing that loneliness is there as well in um, young adulthood, not just in the later life, uh, years in life. Now, is this feeling of loneliness associated with poor mental health in young adulthood? And the answer is yes. Here on the y-axis, you have odds ratios. And odds ratios are an indicator of risk. Risk to have um, depression or anxiety if you report or if you are lonely. Um, as opposed to if you were not lonely. <clears throat> so you can see that um, those um, people who reported uh, being um, lonely are more likely to meet diagnostic criteria for depression, anxiety, ADHD, conduct disorder, alcohol and cannabis dependence. They're also more likely to have self-harm and attempted to their life at age 18. So this is cross-sectional, you know, loneliness and mental health uh, measures measured at age um, 18. If we control for prior symptoms, so at age 12, the association remains the same. So it's not that you have those symptoms and then you become lonely. The association, you know, um, is there even after controlling for prior mental health uh, problems in the e-risk study. And then when you control for comorbidity, so for all these mental health problems, if you kind of control for them in one big regression uh, model, you can see that all the um, associations survive except for alcohol and cannabis dependence. But there is a strong and very um, unique uh, independent association between feeling lonely and having mental health problems at age um, 18. And this diagram nicely illustrate, I think, um, when the, these things happen kind of together. You can see that you have lots of um, variance and loneliness in our study that occurs by itself, but you do have quite a bit of an overlap with depression and also with anxiety. Um, so I think that we should be worried about loneliness in young adults. And we ask the questions, who are those people who are lonely at age 18? Um, who were they when they were children? Can we predict, you know, using all the information that we have in e-risk, can we predict who are the ones who will become lonely um, at age 18? And we've looked at uh, lots of different factors, lots of different variables um, in the e-risk study. And um, uh, one thing which is interesting is that family factors didn't come out as a predictor for um, these feeling of loneliness in young adulthood, but there are some neuroticism, depression, anxiety at age five, but also bullying, victimization, and social isolation, which predict 
loneliness at age 18. And of course, I'm, I, I'm, I want you to kind of, um, I want to emphasize here the association with bullying, victimization and social isolation because it really shows that poor social relationships in childhood will lead to feelings of loneliness um, in young adulthood. The beauty, the methods here, the uh, importance here is really kind of, um, once again, the importance of, of including kind of questions in your um, study that may not necessarily be so obvious. So uh, people who ask questions about bullying victimization, you know, in the late 60s when not many people knew about this. In this case, asking questions about loneliness in this group of young adults when everyone is focusing on loneliness in the elderly being a bit bold when you ask your question. So that's, that's really important because that allows you to discover something new. Implications for interventions. Um, so we know that loneliness is not a mental health problem, but it can be a red flag, you know, that young adults are not doing well. So the experience of loneliness co-occurs with a diverse range of problems in young adulthood. And this may have really important implications for um, later life. So our findings really underscore the importance of prevention by tackling negative relationships in childhood, including social isolation and bullying victimization. Um, and that could prevent people from not being trapped in this kind of cycle of poor relationship throughout their whole life. And this brings me to my last, yes, oh my gosh, my last set of findings, and it is social support. Peter, I will speak just a little bit um, faster now. So I'm moving ahead in the time. So now I want to kind of talk about social support, something positive and midlife. So we know that social support is, is really important. This is something beneficial. You may kind of wonder what does she want to really kind of show us, you know, with these new findings. Um, social support can be emotional. You know, when someone is there to listen to you, you find comfort with them. It can also be structural. So social support can be the number of relationships that you have or how many times you kind of see your friends. There are lots of different ways of measuring social support. Um, <clears throat> and I will talk a little bit about the way that we kind of tackle or measure social support. Um, and I think that social support is especially important when you experience stressful life events, whether it's in childhood, but also, you know, stressful life events happen in adulthood with, um, um, you know, divorce, domestic violence, financial problems, health problems, you know, with caring with young uh, people or the elderly as well. These stressful life events have an impact on mental health problems, but it is possible that having social support can buffer the effect of those stressful life events. And um, the question that we ask here was whether um, just having good enough social relationship, you know, as most of us do have, is that enough to help weather those stressful life events? Or is it possible that when it's difficult, you need more rich social support? So we identify gaps in the literature. More, most of the associations are cross-sectional between social support and a better outcome. Um, most of the studies look at um, benefits, you know, of having social relationships without really quantifying, you know, what does that mean, this, you know, kind of level of social support. And not many studies have looked at social support at midlife when, you know, you have lots of things changing, midlife crisis, divorce, kids kind of leaving home, career changes and all of that. What we did for our study, we kind of combined measures of qualitative and structural um, social support and we made one measure by summing these items. But what we did was really to tackle those rich social resources so we distinguish those 
with really, really high um, levels of support, either emotionally or structurally. Uh, from those of us who have kind of typical, you know, we all have, you know, some kind of relationship somehow, but we wanted to kind of really identify those who had rich support, um, social support. <clears throat> so, and these are people with frequent contact with larger network. Now I need to acknowledge Rukman Semi, who now working at the Resolution Foundation, who conducted that study. And what we showed was that rich social support buffers the effect of high stress on effective symptoms at age 45. On the y-axis, you have mean scores of effective symptoms at um, age 45. And I should mention, this is from the NCDS. And our measure of social resources was taken at age 42. What you have here um, is people who experience one or two life events in the, in the past year. Um, and most of us kind of do encounter that. And what you can see from this graph is that having social resources, whether it's typical or rich, will help you because you have less effective symptoms. But what happens when you have more stressful life events? So if you have three or more life events in a year, you can see here that having rich in the dark blue bar, having rich social support will help you reduce your level of effective, effective symptoms compared to those who have typical social relationship. So actually having many good relationships will help you weather very stressful life event at midlife. The effect was long lasting so you can see that even when we looked at psychological distress at age 50, so five years later, the effect is still there. You don't see an effect, a difference between the rich and the typical social resources when you experience one or two life events. But when you experience three or more, when you really need support, having rich social support really helps you. Once again, we ask the question, who are those with those rich social support? Can we use childhood factors to predict these, this group of people, lucky people? And what we found is that sociability in childhood, so those who kind of go out, kids or teenagers who kind of often goes to parties and discos, um, kids who get on with their parents or kids who see friends outside school. So being social as a kid will predict or will increase your likelihood of having those kind of rich social support later in life, in this case at age um, 42. So the beauty of this um, method here is really kind of identifying groups of people who have those rich uh, social support. So, you know, kind of using this kind of variable of social support, isolating, you know, that really important resource was beneficial for our study. Implication for intervention. So um, I think that midlife is an important time you know, when you experience new things. And I think that having lots of good relationships is important. Quite often we invest in one people or two people. We invest in our partner, our kids, our parents, our siblings. And I think that the findings show we have to expand our social networks to have good relationship with lots of different people. Because if part of the stress comes from divorce, bereavement, it's possible that we lose that source of support. Having many of those good relationships will be beneficial to help us weather those kind of stressful um, events. This is my last slide. Take home messages. I hope I managed to convince you that poor social relationship is harmful for mental health and well-being. On the contrary, having positive relationship can help really help you weather those adverse events that we all encounter in our life. One limit of my presentation, 
I focus on specific types of relationship, but there are many others that I could have presented. I didn't talk about um, domestic violence. I didn't talk about um, social media or kind of using technologies to kind of get in touch with each other, but that would be something really important to um, address as well. There's no specific age, you know, where social relationships are especially important. I showed you that um, each age group, you know, benefits from having good relationships and each one of them kind of um, can also be harmed or suffer from not having um, those good relationships, uh, having bad relationships, sorry. Um, one limit of my presentation, I didn't look at the very early years and the um, elderly where it's also very important um, that um, we, we looked at those relationships and their impact. Interventions, I think that the findings um, that I've shown you really emphasize that early in interventions, you know, kind of managing those relationships, you know, early in life will be beneficial throughout the whole life span. Um, but I think it's never too late. Our findings on social support also show that um, we could benefit from having uh, greater or better relationships. But of course, acting early is always, always um, best. A limit of my presentation, I, I don't do kind of intervention research. So if you ask me what is best, I may not best be the best person to kind of answer the question. But I think that there's really scope to look at intervention involving social relationships. Research methods, I think, are so important to be able to kind of really answer the questions that we have. And we need to explore these methods. And it's a good thing that those methods change, improve, and we need to follow that, I think. They are really important tools. And make sure that the tools don't lead the questions. We have the research questions and we use the tools to answer those questions. And finally, maybe surprisingly, my last take home message, to do all of that, we need data. We need to have the best data to be able to answer those questions. And I am terribly grateful for all those people, you know, who spend many, many years collecting those data, um, interviewing those people. And I'm grateful to all those participants for providing time and answer to all our questions so that we can come up with um, some indication about what can we do best? What's the big ID basically? I cannot leave you without saying thank you to the studies, to the funders who allow us to do the research, um, to the people who manage those big data sets, to the ESRC who believes in me and who believed in the importance of social relationships as well, and to my wonderful colleagues um, who worked with me on those um, studies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing the screen. Yes. And uh, uh, we there you are. Uh, we see you again. Um, and uh, a wonderful and comprehensive talk uh, on uh, uh, important topics, uh, important perhaps now uh, more than ever. We have loads of questions. Oh. Um, so uh, 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 there is, I'm going to take some that you may feel um, uh, better uh, equipped to answer. Uh, but uh, uh, let me just uh, go right back to the bullying uh, yeah. studies. One question is, um, was there a moderating effect of gender uh, in those studies? So uh, that's a really good question. Usually boys are overrepresented. When you look at the topic of um, bullying, they tend to be more, they, they're more likely to bully others. They're more likely to be victims as well. And in terms of the outcome in childhood, we didn't see any real differences. When you look at adulthood, then we start seeing gender differences where girls seems to be more likely to suffer in the long run whether it's mental health problems, but also physical health problems like being overweight, 
uh, and some socioeconomic um, outcome as well, like being unemployed. Um, uh, not unrelated, uh, but a, a, an interesting question. Um, if uh, one twin is being uh, bullied and the other twin not, isn't the twin that's being bullied going to uh, in some way uh, impact uh, the other twin? You know, they have a vicarious experience of being bullied? Qu quite possibly. Um, our analysis somehow controls for that uh, because we look at within, within kind of family differences between the twin controlling for the across family differences. Um, but it is a very good question. And of course, yes, it's possible that um, both twins will have higher level of emotional problems uh, compared to other families, but the twin who's been bullied will have more emotional problems. That's an assumption. I didn't kind of test that, but we suspect that this is, you know, happen at the same at the same time. Uh, an interesting question. There's not so much a question. It's really questioning um, uh, your statement that uh, uh, mental health problems can lead to bullying. Uh, yeah. I think I understood it, but I think it's something that uh, uh, people feel um, uh, is quite an important issue to elaborate. Absolutely. That's a really important point. Um, <clears throat> And I think that um, I think that yes, there are factors that lots of studies identify that makes children more likely to be bullied, to be victims of bullying, and some of those factors uh, can be either associated with the individuals or also with the family. So, for example, kids coming from um, low SES background more likely to experience um, bullying. Um, kids who are maltreated at home by an adult are more likely to be victims of bullying in the school, but children who have mental health problems are more likely to get bullied. And this is not surprising. In some ways, the children who bully others, by definition, will target kids for whom it's more difficult to kind of be, to defend themselves. So quite often, children who already kind of show symptoms of mental health will be an easy target, as not having friends will be also, you know, a factor that will increase those, those likelihood. So in some ways, I think um, it is a really sad finding itself. Um, and it shows that we can do something to prevent bullying by kind of tackling mental health problems. If we tackle mental health problems early in life, we may reduce the occurrence of bullying victimization. Uh, a challenging question um, that, that came up um, uh, is uh, to do with uh, you focusing on resilience. Uh, uh, the challenge is, uh, isn't resilience something that blames the victim uh, in some way? Yeah. Um, yeah. That, <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that you have um, uh, aggression, uh, racist, sexist uh, aggression that needs to be tackled to start focusing on who can cope with that yeah. and who can't cope with that is somehow taking attention away from racism, sexism uh, and social injustice. Yeah, absolutely. I it did happen to me to kind of make a presentation and having parents who kind of said to me, don't tell me about resilience. You know, my kids are victims of bullying. You know, it's not my kids are responsible. The focus should be on the other kids. I think that the findings or the way I want to frame resilience is really to empower kids saying, I can do something, I can change something. So it's not just about the other person. Of course, you know, of course, it's not about the, the victim is not the, the cause or it's not the reason. It's really the kids who bully others. They, their behavior should be stopped. But in some ways, the victims can contribute to the solution by building resilience, by not giving them the opportunity to be the target of, um, of bullying. Um, 
Can I just uh, uh, follow that up? Um, what about the bullies themselves? Are, yes. are, what about the, the mental health problems in the bullies? Uh, yes. That's exactly it. So I think that quite often, um, I was, that's exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> Um, and that can be really controversial, controversial once again, but I think that we need to acknowledge that those children who bully others, they have mental health needs as well. So we need to stop the behaviors, but having a punitive approach towards the kid, I think, is not a complete approach. I think that we need to tackle the behavior, we need to address the mental health needs of those children because they also um, experience mental health problems. Um, one interesting, and this is a final question on bullying, uh, is uh, bullying related to a person's level of sadism? Uh, that they actually, uh, the, the power uh, that they want to feel over another person. Is there any anything that you found uh, uh, that might bear on that? Um, it's interesting because every single talk I give, you know, I always focus on the victims because um, they are the one I'm interested in, but people will always bring me back to the children who bully others. And we do have a study um, on this, you know, who are they? I always thought, you know, children who bully others, they are children with conduct problems. Bullying other is a criteria for the disorder of, you know, conduct disorders, basically. So. And there's lots and lots of research on conduct disorders and you know the predictors and the outcomes and all of that. Um, what we show is that um, they're quite similar. You know, bullying others and having other type of conduct problems go hand in hand. Um, we don't seem to kind of find anything specific about bullying others. Um, but it, what we do find is that later on, they do have mental health problems in addition to um, be antisocial and have a criminal record and all of that. So, but we don't have those measures of um, psychopathic traits or um, cynicism. We don't have that. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, go quickly to uh, um, the uh, loneliness studies. Yeah. Um, uh, but in the, those, uh, children who, um, uh, well, I'll ask, who had warm, uh, rich social uh, connections. Um, uh, was there any kind of uh, racial, socioeconomic, demographic uh, features linked with that? And did you come, you know, uh, did you control for that uh, when you found that it, uh, they were protected to, in some ways, to some extent? Are you talking about loneliness or social support? Well, I'm talking about social support, um, uh, having when there is stress um, and uh, uh, the, uh, those who are, uh, have rich relationships around them uh, are, are, are protected. Um, yes. Oh, and I'm trying to remember from the study. I know that we control for that, so there's no confound. But I think that, yes, we do have, we did look for an association between socioeconomic status and in NCDS and those kind of rich social support. And there was a relationship. So, of course, you know, the more kind of um, comfortable you are um, socioeconomically, the more likely you, do, you are to have those, um, those resources. We control for the effect, but there is a correlation between the two, which, yeah. yeah. Um, now, I, I, I wouldn't be doing justice to uh, the current situation if I didn't ask, uh, transmit one of the questions uh, that probably occurred to many people. Uh, you emphasize the importance of social relationships. That's accepted, but we can't have them at the moment. But we can have <laughs> virtual relationships. Yeah. Now, do virtual relationships, in your view, I know you don't necessarily have the data on this, but do you, in your, is your intuition that those virtual relationships uh, uh, would count to mitigate uh, the effect of uh, loneliness or social isolation? I would say that. Um, um, Technology helps us maintain 
um, relationships. So I'm not sure about you, but I managed to kind of keep in touch with my colleagues and my friends, you know, using Zoom and the internet and all of that. So that helped us uh, mitigate the social isolation that we may have experienced. I think that uh, technology will not replace new relationships, you know, kind of the, the opportunity that we have to build new relationship when we meet face to face, when we go to the pub, when we teach in front of a whole class, that will not replace that. I think that there are huge benefits from technology to maintain relationship, but I don't think that it is so helpful for establishing or developing new relationships. Um, listen, I'm being a, a dreadful, dreadful chair and uh, I've allowed us uh, to overrun uh, slightly already. Um, but um, uh, I really wanted to say uh, what a, a really, truly important uh, contribution that you have made and this research makes to make us really aware of uh, and make us really value the people around us, uh, the, the people who can do us so much good uh, with kindness and uh, uh, with attention and with warmth uh, and with responsivity. Uh, and that, that's an incredible treasure. Uh, and that's uh, something that interventionists, you know, I know that you're not one, but that must, must uh, uh, really exploit because the, what your research so, shows so clearly, Louise, is that uh, in the absence of that, uh, life is just much harder uh, and it's much harder and uh, much more difficult uh, for uh, everyone uh, to uh, uh, cope with. Um, I, uh, in that kind of vein, I, I really would like to uh, thank everybody uh, uh, for uh, being here with us and for joining us in this little community, uh, to attending, for attending the seminar and for contributing with questions uh, and uh, to join us uh, at the Anna Freud Center to help us think about mental health and how we apply what we know to better effect. And you've given us a wonderful illustration of how knowledge that's scientifically rigorous can actually benefit uh, with suggestions uh, for interventions, uh, the many, many uh, who do need it. Now, before we leave, I would like to ask you to try and fill in the evaluation form and suggest ideas for any themes for future talks or identify issues that you think uh, we should consider. And uh, people who would like to invite us, who us to invite in, in the future. The next uh, uh, slot, the next uh, one is on 17th of February, uh, the same time and uh, uh, the brilliant Professor Carl Friston will talk about the physics of selfhood in his seminar, me, and my Markov blanket. Uh, I hope that enticing title will encourage you to join us on the 17th. But Louise, thank you so, so much for an outstanding, outstanding talk. Thank you thank very you. much.